in the model Y, we actually added what we call off-road mode, which is a little bit of that brake torque vectoring to like on steroids. Maybe you're doing a little bit of river rocking and, and one wheel gets off the ground. We clamp that down and the other three put torque forward so you still keep moving. And that's something that gives the Model Y a capability that you might not otherwise get in a pretty sporty crossover SUV. There's been a lot of talk about the rear casting and how cool it is and what it does, but one of the problems when you make big pieces of aluminum is that they warp when you heat treat them. Well, with Model Y, we actually invented our own alloy that is able to achieve super high levels of strength and durability. So that saves money, costs, energy, because we don't have to heat treat it with these giant ovens. But more importantly, keeps the part straight and that means we don't have to machine the whole thing. From an engineering geek out standpoint, that's like one of the coolest parts of the thing is like, yeah, you can look at it and say, okay, they replaced the 100 parts with, with one or two, but really the, the alloy and the, the material development on that was super special um, because we wouldn't have been able to do that without it. Welcome to Electrified. It's your host, Dylan Loomis. Just an early heads up for next week. No video on Tuesday, July 4th. When it comes to Monday and Wednesday, it'll be up in the air. I have a lot of friends and family in town for the week that I never get to see so I'm going to be available for them. I just don't know what their schedules look like. So if I don't upload Monday and Wednesday, that's why, but I'm going to try to, so we'll see. We have the Driven reporting that in Australia, almost all of Tesla's inventory is now cleared out after Tesla started offering some incentives. It's also being reported we've hit a new record number of ships to Australia for the quarter, totaling 16. And the last time I checked, I believe each ship can fit about 2,000 Tesla vehicles. And doing some simple math, if you take the fact that only about 8,152 have been delivered in the first two months of the quarter, that could mean a pretty big third month of the quarter for Tesla Australia. In case you missed it, it looks like the Model Y production lines at Giga Texas will be shut down for five days at the beginning of July, spanning the July 4th holiday for line upgrades. After that, there is expected to be a slower production ramp schedule so that the employees can get used to the new lines. Simultaneously, Giga Texas is switching away from swing shifts and moving to day and night only. And of course, this reporting is coming from Joe Tetmeyer. For now, we don't know much about these upgrades other than the intended end goal is to have, of course, higher production. We just don't know what the number is, but it's supposed to be higher than the 5,000 per week number they've hit in the past. Additionally, those swing shift workers are going to be re directed to, yes, the Cybertruck production line to finalize testing, calibration, and to get the lines into production status. That'll be happening in July into August. Joe reporting there's a new Tesla manufacturing site about 20 miles southwest of Giga Texas. This is where they may produce seats and some other sub-assemblies, potentially for both the Model Y and the Cybertruck. Joe then had another tweet sharing some pictures from Jeff Roberts of two other companies in that same area around this new production site for Tesla named Plasticon and Simwon NA, both making interior parts and sub-assemblies potentially for the Y and the Cybertruck. So I'll watch Joe's flyovers for any potential looks at this new manufacturing site, but it's good to hear Tesla is still planning to make their own seats because there were reports that they may stop. We also have 36KR reporting that the new rear wheel drive Model 3 out of China is going to get a new battery pack, this time from CATL, and it will be the LFMP chemistry. But not only will it be a new, supposedly better chemistry, it's also going to be a larger battery pack going from 60 to 66 kilowatt hours. The report also said this new battery pack can also be used in future revisions of the Model Y. There's that talk of Project Juniper that's supposed to be a refresh of the Model Y. Of course, we haven't really seen or heard much about that, but maybe Tesla is planning a slight refresh for the Model Y in 2024. And this source is also saying that Model 3 Project Highland production is supposed to begin in China in September. Right now in China, there are only two versions of the Model 3 available in the configuration the rear wheel drive and the performance. And based on this reporting, they're saying both versions are going to get a range boost with these upgraded battery packs, the rear wheel drive version getting about 27 extra miles and the performance version getting an extra 15. To be fair, there have been reports of Tesla switching over to LFMP cells in the past and it didn't happen. So just keep that in mind. Honestly, I was surprised by the reaction of some people online to this news, Electrify America, saying they're going to adopt the NACs. 
Did people really think that they weren't going to with all of the recent announcements and all of these vehicles set to have the NAX port by 2025? If Electrify America wants to make money, they almost have to adopt the NAX. And yes, Electrify Canada's fast charging network is included as well. EA will work to offer a NAX connector option at existing and future charging stations by 2025, and they'll continue to support the CCS1. The latest update, EA has 850 charging stations with around 4,000 chargers in the United States and Canada. In case you're new to the EV story, Electrify America really only exists as a penalty for VW's diesel scandal. If you're not familiar with that, check out the Netflix documentary. So yes, I'll go out on a limb here and say that VW and the subsidiaries, Porsche, Audi, and the others will eventually be announcing they're adopting the NAX, at least in North America, of course. And as expected today, Polestar makes it official they're also adopting the NAX. When we heard the Volvo Domino fell, we knew it was only a matter of time for Polestar. From 2025, Polestar vehicles sold in North America will be equipped with a NAX port by default, Adapters will allow drivers to access the supercharging network mid-2024. This agreement applies to current and future Polestar models, and future NAX-equipped Polestar vehicles will come with a CCS adapter. And what do you know? They mentioned that 12,000 charging point number, when in reality, Tesla has closer to 19,000 in North America. So to me, it sounds like these companies won't have access to all of Tesla's supercharging locations, at least to start. And honestly, as I said on Twitter, it's just great to see all of these announcements because 10 years ago, Tesla took a huge risk in starting this supercharger network. Back then there were four locations. Fast forward to today and Tesla has over 5,000 worldwide with 99.9% .9 uptime. And over the past 10 years, the rest of the industry sat on their hands rooting for Tesla to fail. Well, fail they did not and here we are today. So it's great to see Tesla rewarded for all of their hard work and innovation. The Model Y has won Auto Vista's Best Residual Value Award for 2023. This is basically an award for European competitors and Tesla beat out the Enyaq, the Q4, the EX90, and the ID4. The summary, this award confirms our internal data and what our partners across Europe are telling us. Model Y is a safe investment. The Model Y was the best selling car overall globally and in Europe during the first quarter of 2023 and hopefully will be the best selling car of any kind this year globally, period. I won't get into the detail because most of us already know about the OTA updates, cars getting better with time, the safety, the features, the pricing, and all of that good stuff. But it's below if you wanna check it out. At first glance, this press release from the Department of Energy sounds great, but there's a reason we need to actually read the articles. They released a notice of intent to invest $2 billion from the IRA to accelerate domestic manufacturing of EVs, and the money is supposed to be divvied out in the coming months. But then the not great part, they say, it's going to provide cost shared grants for domestic production of efficient hybrid, plug in electric hybrid, plug in electric drive, and hydrogen fuel cell electric vehicles. The money will support commercial facilities, including those for vehicle assembly, component assembly, and related part manufacturing. But here's the kicker it will prioritize projects that refurbish or retool manufacturing facilities that have recently ceased operation or are expected to cease operating in the near future with the goal of preserving existing jobs, including union jobs and wages. I'd hate to classify this as a veiled bailout because of course I support trying to keep as many jobs and factories in operation as possible, but is this the most efficient way to spend the money? You can definitely argue it. Looking at the wait times for the Tesla China configurator, all variants of the Model Y are now two to six weeks, up from one to five previously. Both variants of the Model 3 are still one to four weeks. Personally, I think this is awesome. We have Japan looking to get students fresh out of high school to teach them how to make batteries to boost that industry over the next decade. In case you didn't know, with all of the huge Gigafactory announcements for the next decade, good battery engineers are lacking worldwide. In the article, they talk about Giga Nevada saying, Reno has limited resources of labor and it's hard to get the talent we need. We have a history of struggling to get workers in Reno. And good news, Panasonic has been in talks with several US community colleges to help train workers for new factories that it's building in the United States, including the one in Kansas. This would be great whiteboard material for the Tesla locker room. We have John Murphy, the lead analyst for 
Bank of America, speaking of the Cybertruck, saying, I think it will be a niche vehicle and that it won't be selling huge volume after the initial rush of orders due to pent up demand. I'm a realist. I know that there's a chance he's correct, but I also have a feeling we'll be coming back to this one in a few years and it's not going to be because he was right. It looks like we have one of our first companies marketing Cybertruck wraps. This one is from Wrapmate and they have a configurator where you can choose your color and save your configuration. So I'll have this link below if you're interested. Sounds like you can actually start purchasing some of these later this year. As far as I can tell, it looks like Wrapmate has around 2000 different certified installers across the country. So you may not have to travel as far as you'd think. In case you're interested, this will be linked below. On GitHub for Tesla, it looks like there's some new fleet telemetry data available. This isn't really for fleet managers. This is more for those companies like Teslify we talked about yesterday to have easier access to some of Tesla's data to improve their third-party services. So again, if this is of interest to you, it'll be below. Oftentimes, Tesla detractors will mock Tesla for saying they're not level three, Mercedes is, Mercedes is ahead of Tesla. Well, the reason Tesla is staying by choice at level two is basically because of this. Right now, Mercedes is saying that legally they know how it's going to work for who's at fault in the event of an accident or even a speeding ticket when they're about to launch their new drive pilot system in 2024. But the problem is not all of the legal experts are in agreement. And to make matters more complicated, legal experts are saying the answer may vary depending on the state. So apparently when Mercedes rolls this feature out in certain states, if the car gets a ticket, it might not go to the driver, it might go to Mercedes, the company, if of course Drive Pilot was in operation. So yeah, Mercedes might be the first company to roll out level three autonomy, meaning the human is not in control when the system is operating. But at the same time, Mercedes has been very tight lipped about what the driver can actually do when Drive Pilot is engaged. Can they read a book, watch TV? How long can they have their hands off the wheel? Are they supposed to still be paying attention? They've just, as you can see, declined to say. But a company spokesperson said a more detailed tech update that clarifies those ambiguities may be forthcoming closer to the launch of Drive Pilot. The Spanish government is set to boost electric vehicle sales. They just approved a deduction of 15% of income tax for the purchase of EVs. This will apply until the end of December 2025. The maximum deduction that can be claimed is 20,000 euros or about 21.7 thousand US dollars. Not bad. So for the few of you in Spain, you may want to have a further look. I thought this one was funny. We have Reuters reporting that VW is currently in discussions with Tesla about adopting NAX, but they said they're talking about optimizing it for its customers as if the supercharging network needs optimizing at all, and Volkswagen is going to be the company to give those optimizations to Tesla. Either way, the VW group is currently evaluating adopting the NAC, so my guess would be it's just a matter of days. At the same time, VW has just replaced the Audi chief executive. Gernot Dolner will be the new CEO and he'll start on September 1st, this all to push forward electrification. Audi plans to bring 10 new electric models to its lineup ahead of plans to produce only EVs starting in 2026. It's really right around the corner. Dolner spent a few years as a top level manager at Porsche and he was the head of Porsche's four door Panamera sedan series that he helped develop. Most excitingly though, one of his main tasks once he starts is pushing ahead talks on opening a factory in North America. Just in case you or somebody you know owns an Ionic 5 or 6, right now there's a $2,500 loyalty discount discount that can be paired with the $7,500 lease incentive, so you could get up to $10,000 off a new Hyundai. There are some other details and incentives, but in case this is you, it'll be linked below. Electrek reporting the first sellable Chevy Blazer is rolling off the production line in Mexico. Sales of this vehicle are supposed to start this summer and the entry price is about $45,000, so this should compete directly with the Model Y. Now the question becomes how many can GM make and how fast. And the range figures for the Blazer from the website, we're looking at 247 up to 320 miles. I've said before how important I think this vehicle is to Chevy and GM, and honestly, I think a lot of people will like it, so hopefully they can produce it. You can find me on Twitter at DylanLoomis22. Hope you guys have a wonderful day. Please like the video if you did, and a huge thank you to all of my Patreon supporters.